This is Audiobook Warriors. AW presents an unabridged recording of Manacled by Sen Lin Yu. Chapter 70 Draco looked away and shook his head. What is the point of a legitimacy if you don't use it to keep someone from killing you? He scoffed, the sound harsh and angry in the back of his throat. He survived as a spy through two wizarding wars, only to be killed by an insurgent vampire coven. Hermione could feel the cold rage starting to emanate from him. She swallowed. The news felt like a concussion. After days of dreading Severus's arrival, of regarding it as a foregone conclusion, his sudden absence felt like a seismic shift. Everything had been thrown into the air, and there was no telling how it would land. Is it confirmed that he's dead? He might have escaped. Draco looked back at her and gave a slow nod. It's confirmed. They sent the bodies back with a message. The blood of the Dark Lord's servants will fuel the revolution. His corpse was drained. I personally confirmed that it was him. Draco gave a sharp sigh and started pulling off his Death Eater robes. The rest of Eastern Europe is expected to follow suit within the next few days. It's... Draco snorted. It's the collapse we orchestrated. We just hoped they'd wait until July. Severus claimed he had everything under control. He sneered. Fucking idiot. The last words were half snarled. Hermione swallowed and forced herself to breathe. Her stomach felt as though there were a weight in it so painful she wanted to double over and vomit. She was going to die. She and the baby and Draco were all going to die. Severus had been the vital piece. He'd been her last hope. She'd thought that maybe he'd help her find a way to save Draco. She'd told him before she left for Sussex that she needed Draco to live. He had to know she wasn't going to fly away quietly while Draco went off to commit suicide. She'd mentally rehearsed a speech begging him. I told you I need Draco. I'll do anything, anything it takes, anything you want. Please help me. Please help me. If I lose him, I'll die of a broken heart. I'll do anything you ask if you help me save him. She'd clung to the idea that Severus might have ideas that she and Draco hadn't considered. Without him, she suddenly felt the last tiny ray of hope gutter out. It was as though a black hole had opened under her feet, swallowing not only her desperate hope for Draco's survival, but hers and their babies as well. Draco looked as though he were on the verge of a breakdown. He breathed in sharply through his teeth and dragged a hand through his hair before kicking his robes across the room. Her hand twitched towards him. She felt as though she might faint. She reached out and touched him lightly on the arm. He stared down at her. He looked so tired. It's, it's all right, Draco, she said, meeting his eyes. Her voice threatened to waver, but she forced it to stay steady. It's all right, she said again. Don't do anything to yourself. Her chest spasmed and her fingers gripped his sleeve. You did everything you could, more than anyone should ever have asked. I'd rather die in your arms. Draco looked at her for a moment before his eyes narrowed. You're still leaving. Hermione stared at him blankly. He reached up, his fingertips brushed her cheek. I can still get you out. Severus was the safest option, but there are other options. I didn't mean for you to think you wouldn't escape now. Hermione was still gripping his sleeve. He rested his hand on hers. It won't be as clean, it's longer, and it'll be a more difficult journey for you to take. His expression was worried especially pregnant. Ginny will come back to Britain and take you. Before Hermione could react, he called out, Topsy? Topsy instantly appeared in the room. Topsy, Severus is dead, he said matter-of-factly. The rage was gone. He was cold and intent, back on mission. An option had been eliminated. He'd moved on to the next, unhesitating, unyielding, driven to succeed. Severus had been a mechanism for getting what he wanted.
Granger will leave for Europe via the route Creature and I established this spring. You and Creature will both leave tonight for Ginny's safe house. When you arrive, you will take over the care of James while Creature brings Ginny back. Everything you'll need for the journey is in the safe house at Whitecroft. I'll send word so she'll expect you. Topsy looked up at Draco and then folded her arms obstinately. If Topsy is going, who is taking care of the miss? Draco considered for a moment. Bobbin. Bobbin will take care of her while you're with James. Topsy shook her head. The miss is not even knowing Bobbin. She is only knowing Topsy. Bobbin knows babies. Bobbin is not knowing one thing about pregnant witches. Topsy will stay. Draco gave a long, suffering sigh as he stared down at Topsy, whose chin was only slightly higher than his knees. Bobbin could care for James in the short term, but if the escape doesn't go as planned, you'll be caring for him for the foreseeable future. Bobbin is not capable of that. Topsy began opening her mouth, but Draco raised an eyebrow pointedly and continued, I'm aware it's not ideal, but Ginny trusts you with James. I can't have her balk or delay because I sent a house elf she doesn't know. But, Draco's expression grew icy. Topsy, I did not call you to consult with you. You will go to care for James. That is an order. If all goes well, you'll see Granger again within the month. Now go. Topsy stood for a moment as she stared up at Draco. Then she blinked and her enormous eyes filled with tears. And when will Topsy be seeing Master Draco again? Draco stared down at her for a moment and his throat dipped as he pressed his lips into a flat line. Don't do this, Topsy. This has always been the plan. Topsy shook her head and stomped her tiny foot. You was not even saying goodbye. You was just sending Topsy away. An enormous tear slid down Topsy's nose and splashed onto the floor. Topsy was to say to the end, you promised. Draco looked at her, his eyes flickering for a moment before they turned flint-like and his expression hardened. It's not an option now, Topsy. You have orders from your master. Topsy didn't move. She kept staring up at Draco and several more tears splashed onto the floor. Topsy, go now. His voice was cold and firm, and Hermione felt the magic in the air. Topsy's eyes widened with horror, and she reached towards him. No, please, Master Draco. She vanished before she'd finished speaking. Draco stared down at the empty space for a moment before turning away. He sighed and suddenly looked so exhausted Hermione thought he might just fall backwards. She was at a loss. Topsy's expression of desperate horror felt branded into her eyes. You should have let her say goodbye, she finally said. Draco nodded dully. I don't know how to. He sighed and rolled his jaw. You can tell her I'm sorry when you see her again. He seemed to regard the matter as closed. Hermione felt a growing sort of hysterical rage. She helped raise you. If she thought she was going to be with you until the end, you should have at least given her a chance to say goodbye. You can't, you can't just use people like they're tools for getting what you want and force them away if their emotions inconvenience you. Draco looked at her sharply, irritation visible in his silver eyes. My entire life is comprised of emotional fallout. He looked feral. Sometimes... I don't have the capacity to handle any more of it. Hermione pressed her lips together, but they twisted. Is this what you're going to do to me, too, when it's my turn to go? Draco's eyes glinted. No, although it would be fitting. We were never much for goodbyes, as I recall. She looked down and fidgeted with her hands. You should have let her say goodbye. A few more minutes wouldn't have hurt. Now she's going to feel... I'm aware of how it feels to lose someone without saying goodbye, Granger. His knuckles were white and his jaw clenched as he snarled the words. It was like being kicked in the stomach. She felt herself pale. Draco's eyes burned as he glared at her with all of his bitter rage. 
Then he blinked, and the emotions vanished behind his occlumency walls. Sorry, I'm sorry, just... just tell her I'm sorry, he said in a clipped voice. Hermione swallowed bitterly as she nodded. She looked down at her hands, trying to think of something else to talk about. I didn't know you were in contact with Ginny, she finally said. Draco shrugged and appeared relieved by the change of subject. Not much. I used to visit on occasion, mainly to ensure she hadn't tried to run off. He raised an eyebrow. She tried to cut my throat with a steak knife when I told her the order had lost. He gave Hermione a pointed look. Shockingly enough, it was rather difficult to make her believe I was keeping her locked in a safe house for her protection. Hermione's eyes dropped away. She hadn't considered how fraught a situation it would have been for Draco to be the one informing Ginny that the war had been lost and her entire family killed, or how he would ever have managed to convince her that he was trustworthy. Once the Dark Lord restricted me from leaving Britain without permission, we primarily used a scroll with a protean charm for occasional communication. Topsy was with her, helping care for James until you were assigned to me. Ginny was aware that you'd finally been found and that the plan was for you to join her. I sent her updates from time to time about your memory loss and what condition you were in, so she'd know what to expect. So... She's aware that you've become pregnant. Draco looked down and straightened the cufflinks on his shirt. Hermione studied him for a moment. What? Draco looked up from his sleeve, his expression closed. Well, she was informed of the context in which you were being sent here to the manor. Unfortunately, she... She assumed I had a greater ability to subvert instruction and protect you than I did. She only realised that wasn't the case when I sent word that you were pregnant. His jaw twitched minutely. Suffice to say, the begrudging tolerance she'd developed up till that point has permanently gone now. He cleared his throat. I hadn't anticipated the Dark Lord knowing about you when I was trying to get you out of Europe. Aside from the safe house in Denmark, most of the escape routes in place weren't feasible. I used Creature to establish a secondary port key route that Ginny could use, but it wasn't completed until the end of April. He cocked his head to the side. Muggle aeroplanes were an idea I had, but the Muggle Prime Minister has been collaborating closely with the Ministry. Polyducing you as a Muggle was an option, but not when you were pregnant, and there are variables I wouldn't have been able to control in the Muggle world. He abruptly seemed to realise he was rambling and cut himself off, so port keys were the best I could do. Hermione stared up at him. I have to say, you've ended up being quite expensive, Granger. There was a reason why international port key travel was restricted. Intercontinental port key displacement could drop a wizard into outer space if incorrectly calculated. There was elaborate and specialised expertise necessary for intercontinental port key creation to the extent that most were government-sponsored and owned in order to be affordable. Hermione knew because the Order had pursued the idea of obtaining a port key to Australia or Canada in order to evacuate the children and refugees. Legally purchased, it would have used an eighth of Harry's vault. On the black market, the price would easily have been double or triple that. It won't be as untraceable as the route with Severus, Draco was saying, He'd caught her hand in his and one of his fingertips slid along her inner wrist and twitched at the manacle locked there. You should use the extra time to regain more weight and build up your stamina. She furrowed her eyebrows as she stared up at him. How will you get the manacles off without Severus? Draco gave a dry laugh. Removing them was never really an obstacle. The difficulty has always been getting you out of Europe safely immediately afterwards. There are plenty of Death Eaters who'll do anything they're told once you find the right pressure point. Hermione nodded stiffly. How long? Until Ginny comes. Draco furrowed his eyebrows and then quirked one up as he calculated. 
The house elves will have to operate to the safe house by a series of jumps since they can't use port keys. It takes more than a week to operate to the safe house. Creature will escort Ginny back and show her the route. It's a series of connected port keys rather than one. The margin for error is smaller when the distance is reduced. She'll probably arrive in three weeks, depending on how she handles port key travel. More time, whispered Hermione's desperate, greedy heart. But the instant it occurred to her, the guilt struck her. Now that she was no longer primarily dreading him, the reality of Severus's death was slowly washing over her. Severus, her mentor, her colleague, one of the few people she had regarded as having truly known her. He'd been changed to the war even longer than Hermione and Draco. She'd often wondered what the reason was of his switch in allegiance. Whatever it had been, the secret had died with him. Draco went and dropped under the chair. Did you know Severus well? she asked. He looked up at her, his eyes were cool grey, but a thin smile played at the corner of his mouth. No, he didn't like me. Hermione looked down. I'm sorry. When he wasn't giving me orders, he spent most of his time telling me I didn't deserve to have someone like you care about me. That you were worth ten of me. He raised an eyebrow. When it wasn't Severus saying it, it was Ginny, although she placed the number somewhat higher. Draco's availability abruptly ended with Severus's death. He was called away less than an hour later, and Hermione didn't see him until he arrived briefly the next afternoon in order to introduce Hermione to Topsy's replacement. Bobbin was a younger elf. Hermione wasn't sure how old any of the elves were, but Topsy had easily been older than Creature, and Bobbin seemed to be about the age Dobby had been. As Hermione studied her, she realised she'd seen her before. Bobbin was the elf Astoria had sent when Hermione had first arrived at the manor. Bobbin gave a low curtsy. Bobbin will be doing her best, miss. Tell Bobbin anything you want. She's aware of the restrictions you have. Draco's mind was clearly elsewhere. He walked away without a word. Hermione didn't see Draco again for more than a day. She forced herself to eat, even though it made her stress nausea worse. She started working out again. A longer journey, a harder journey. Multiple porkies while pregnant. The pregnancy guide had included a long section explaining the risks of displacement transport during pregnancy. Port keys were preferable to apparition, but either form tended to make witches violently ill and could cause contractions or premature labour. A potion to settle the stomach and a dose of calming draught beforehand was strongly recommended if the use of a port key was necessary. Hermione had no idea how she'd handle port keying. In a worst case scenario, repeatedly port keying could send her into premature labour. If she lost the baby in the process of escaping without Draco, she thought she would probably die. It might make a difference if she were less physically fragile. She started with basic lunges and crunches. She couldn't push herself off the floor to do a push-up, but she made herself begin doing regular repetitions of everything she could manage. Three weeks. She had three weeks to come up with something better than Draco's new plan. She just needed to get his dark mark off. If she could get it off, there would be numerous methods of escape available to them. If they killed Voldemort, the dark mark would vanish. Potentially, so would the only existing mechanism for removing the manacles. The manacles needed the dark marks to activate the release mechanism. Without marked Death Eaters, everyone manacled might wait years before a way of overriding or recreating Voldemort's dark mark was invented. It might save Draco, though. However, Hermione had no idea how to go about it. Draco refused to discuss any ideas that endangered her, or ran the risk of his cover being blown before her manacles were removed. She didn't even know where Voldemort's castle was. If she could just get Draco's mark off. The anniversary celebration came and the manor sat silent. Hermione spent the day reading 
gnawing her fingernails to the quick and doing exercise repetitions when she felt so anxious she thought she might start panicking. Draco had left the previous afternoon and not returned. That was all Bobbin knew. Lucius had been back to the manor, apparently no worse off for having murdered Astoria. Hermione knew because early in the morning she had seen him standing in the path outside her window, staring up at the north wing. She'd ducked out of sight quickly. The day of the anniversary passed without event for Hermione. Her room felt claustrophobic, as though she were going to suffocate while waiting there. It was the middle of the night when Draco abruptly appeared in the room next to her. He stalked across the room and nearly collapsed on top of her as he wrapped his arms around her waist and dropped his forehead onto her shoulder. Hermione's spine bowed slightly as she held him up. The spent dark magic hanging off him was almost enough to make her gag. Are you all right? What's wrong? Has something happened? She asked, her voice frantic as she ran fingers over him trying to find an injury. I'm fine. His voice was muffled in her robes. I'm just tired. He lifted his head and straightened it as he stared down at her. It was a long day. Sit down. She pulled him over to the bed and he sat heavily on the edge of it. She studied him. He looked frayed. What happened? He stared up at her. His expression was drained, but there was a cold sort of triumph in his eyes. The Dark Lord didn't take the news regarding Romania well and overexerted himself yesterday. He failed to appear at today's celebration. Draco tilted his head to the side and the corner of his mouth twisted up into a smirk. There's blood in the water. If anyone had doubts that he's weak, it's all but confirmed now. He's facing the end. Even he knows it. Hermione studied him. The light in her room was dim, but he seemed ghastly pale, as though he'd been drained of colour. But... He shrugged a shoulder. Well, I'm supposed to be his successor. I had to fill both roles in his absence. The triumph in his expression faded into exhaustion. It was a few more killing curses than I'd expected. He suddenly looked young. A flicker of boyish vulnerability appeared for a moment. I don't know. He cut himself off and was silent for several seconds. I'll be fine. I'm just tired, he finally said. Hermione tangled her fingers in his hair. Oh, Draco. She wondered sometimes if there would be an eventual point when the heart of Isis would fail. Surely it couldn't function indefinitely. It was already absorbing all the dark magic that should have been seeping out of Draco's runes. That, combined with everything else Draco regularly did... Hermione banished the thought. He had a far more immediate fate to escape before she needed to worry about the dark magic corrosion killing him. She brushed her fingers against his cheek. His skin was icy cold. In the moonlight, with his pale hair and eyes, he almost seemed like a ghost she was clinging to. She was magicless. She had no spells or healing to offer. Go to sleep. You should sleep, she said. You'll feel better if you can rest. He gave a nod and slumped down. She ran her fingers through his hair, twisting it round her fingers and watching it slip free. She traced along his knuckles and then rubbed her hand against his, trying to impart some warmth from wherever it had leached out of him. His hands spasmed from time to time when he moved in his sleep. He had such long fingers. In another life, he could have been a healer or a musician. He would have had the perfect hands for it. Just another thing Voldemort ruined. She sat beside him, watching him sleep, feeling him grow slowly warmer. He jerked abruptly awake, snatching his fingers away from hers and gripping his left forearm as he sat up. He pressed a kiss against her forehead and left without a word. Hermione didn't see him again for two days. She read the Prophet's recap of the anniversary celebration, 
predictably, Voldemort's absence was barely mentioned and heavily excused. There was more time devoted to Astoria's failure to appear. Draco had killed 75 prisoners over the course of the day. Speeches and entertainment, and then he was called up to kill traitors and resistance fighters. It had happened in three sets. 25 prisoners all lined up for him to execute, again and again. It was an unbelievable quantity of killing curses. The revolution in Romania was dismissed as a minor local uprising not related to Voldemort's regime at all. Hermione read the paper through twice and then went back to her books, back to her exercise repetitions. While she was forcing herself to do any unbearable quantity of crunches on the floor, she refined and perfected the theory of the potion until it was flawless. In another life, if she could have become a researcher, Inventing the theory would have been a distinguishing success, like the 12 uses of dragon's blood, even if four were entirely theory-based. The deepening understanding of magical theory would have been notable in its own right. But Hermione did not care about a theoretical potion. She needed a real one with ingredients she could actually obtain. She had no idea how to get hold of Phoenix Tears. Fawkes had vanished after Dumbledore's funeral at Hogwarts and never been seen again. Phoenixes weren't even native to Europe. The only two known domesticated phoenixes in the last century were Forks and Sparky, the mascot of the New Zealand Quidditch team. Domestication had been more common a few hundred years before, but whatever the art of reliably earning a phoenix's loyalty was, it had been lost to history. She lay in the middle of the floor, panting and thinking while she caught her breath. Her abdominals and legs were burning. If Draco tried to run with her, they'd be hunted down. Voldemort could find him through the dark mark. They'd be hunted from refuge to refuge and the travel would be more and more difficult for her as the pregnancy progressed. Assuming she didn't eventually miscarry from the stress of living on the run, there would later be a baby they were trying to flee with. There was no place to run to. There would be few wizarding countries powerful enough to deter Voldemort's pursuit that wouldn't immediately arrest Draco themselves. Draco might be collared, but he was one of the most dangerous dark wizards in history, and that fact had been heavily emphasised in recent months. It was, as Lucius had said, Draco was Voldemort's hunting dog. He could utilise Draco better if he weren't so afraid of Draco usurping him. Why can't you travel alone now? Why are you restricted but not anyone else? She'd asked Draco during one of the days before Severus had been killed. He'd sighed and glanced away. The Dark Lord began receiving reports that I was privately visiting the homes of Death Eaters and powerful allies. He assumed I was attempting to garner support in order to depose him. Leaving Britain again without express permission will be open treason, without exception. Her throat had tightened. It was because you were looking for me. He just nodded. Their attempts to hold on to each other had carved their hope for escape into a shard so narrow she sometimes wondered if she were imagining its existence. No, she could save him. She was certain there was some way to do it. She just needed to figure out what it was. She'd never been very good at chess, even when she'd had occlumency. She'd never been able to stay detached about using people. That was where she and Draco diverged. If she wanted to save Draco, she needed to be more ruthless, as ruthless as he was. She sank back into thought, pacing in slow circles and geometric patterns around her room until she felt an almost indescribable sensation occur in her lower abdomen. In some ways, It was not an actual sensation, but a feeling that something had occurred. Fluttering. She froze and stared down at her stomach. There was the beginning of a small swell between the jut of her hip bones. She almost forgot sometimes that she was pregnant. The fact felt too overwhelming to process in light of all the more immediate concerns she had. When focused on the immediate future, A pregnancy felt more like a medical diagnosis that she had to account for than an actual baby.
She had never planned to have children. When she'd been in school, motherhood had been an eventual goal so far removed from the present, she'd barely contemplated it. Children, someday, after she graduated and had a job and found someone she'd consider a partner. Then the war came, and having children then had felt almost criminal to Hermione. Ginny had seen James as a promise and a beacon of hope, but to Hermione, a child in a war was someone vulnerable, someone entirely helpless to protect themselves from the incalculable pain that existed. Selfish, not worth the danger. Get married, have children. She'd stopped expecting to ever have those things years ago when she'd secretly been using more and more dark magic. She'd coldly smothered the idea when she gave her words to be a Death Eater's willing war prize. It was little more than a fantasy by the time she'd become complicit in war crimes herself and eventually volunteered to coordinate and manage them. She had meant it when she told Draco about the world she wanted but never expected to have a part in. She didn't have any idea how to be a mother. None of the decisions she'd made in her life had entertained the idea of children. She wasn't sure if wanting to have a child wasn't just her desperate selfishness rearing its head. Poor little healer with no one to take care of. No one who wants you or needs you. You can't bear being alone. You don't know how to function. You need someone to love. You'll do anything for the people that let you love them. Her jaw trembled as she looked down. Maybe Draco had been right. Maybe that was what she was like. She'd always obstinately attached herself to those she thought might need her. Maybe she just wanted to keep the baby so she wouldn't be alone. She pressed her fingers against her abdomen and stood unmoving for several seconds until she felt another flutter, quick as a heartbeat, and then gone again. I'll take care of you, she whispered. I'll do everything I can to be a good mum. There's a potion I can make when you're older. Then, then I'll be able to go outside with you sometimes and you won't be trapped with me. When you grow up and want to go, I'll let you go, I promise. The doorknob abruptly rattled and then went still. Hermione started violently with surprise and then stood, pressing her hands against her chest as her heart pounded, staring at the door. Nothing else happened. She waited and waited but her world had fallen silent again. She crossed the room on her toes and rested her ear against the door. Silent. She couldn't hear the faintest sound through the door, but she knew Draco had warded it. Someone could be shouting on the other side and she wouldn't know. The door didn't move again as she rested her hands against the wood and strained to hear. It could be Lucius. It was possible he was unwilling to wait six months for Draco to remarry and hoped by killing off the mudblood whore he might accelerate the process. Hermione stepped nervously away from the door but then hesitated. The way the door had shaken, it was almost as if someone had fallen against it. She bit her lip and stepped back, pressing her ear more closely to the crack between the door and the frame. She shouldn't. She shouldn't. Draco would tell her not to. Her hand wrapped slowly around the knob and she turned it as silently as she could, cracking the door open. She peered out and her heart stopped. Draco was lying face down on the floor. She flung the door open, rapidly glanced up and down the hall and knelt down, dragging him into her room, She kicked the door shut as she rolled him onto his back and pressed her fingers against his pulse. He was unconscious. He was freezing cold. He was going into shock. His robes were shiny and smelt of rot. There were darkened, silvery smears on his face. He was still breathing. She checked his eyes and found the pupils unevenly dilated. She ran her hands over his shoulders and touched his face gently. Draco? Draco, what's happened to you? She started muttering curses under her breath. She was burning to have her magic back. The manacles around her wrists grew hot as she seethed over her impotence, kneeling over him, trying to guess what had been done. 
she ran her fingers along his arms and hands and felt the rigid knots caused by the cruciatus. She could feel his heart racing in his chest. Bobbin, she called sharply. The elf popped into the room and gave a squeak of horror when her eyes landed on Draco. Who's Draco's healer? Hermione asked. The elf stared blankly at Hermione. Who does he call when he comes back hurt? Bobbin looked down at her hands. Bobbin is not knowing. Bobbin is mostly being in the kitchens and cleaning. The master is not calling Bobbin when he is being hurt, only Topsy or Creature. Hermione looked down in frustration and drew a deep breath before looking back up. Do you know where he keeps his medical supplies? Healing potions, things like that? Bobbin brightened and nodded eagerly. Good, Hermione said in a tight voice. Bring me pain relief potions then, every variety you have and any other medical supplies you have access to. Bring them all here so I know what I have to work with. Bobbin vanished with a loud pop and Draco twitched. Hermione looked down at him. He was dazedly staring up towards her. His eyes were unfocused without any signs of recognition. Draco? He blinked. Granger? He looked entirely bewildered. Draco. She touched him gently on the cheek and held her voice steady, calming. What did he do to you? How long were you crucioed? He furrowed his eyebrows and squinted. Where are we? He kept blinking as though he were trying to see in the dark. Hermione's throat tightened. We're in my room. I think you must have apparated and passed out just outside my door. His expression twisted. His pupils were blown wide. He shook his head and a low groan escaped him. I didn't mean to come here. Hermione's eyes started burning and she brushed his forehead lightly with her fingertips. I know. Her throat caught tightly. Draco twitched at the sound and his eyebrows knitted together. Are you all right? I can't. Are you breathing? He reached up blindly in the direction of her voice and his hand grazed her cheek. Hermione caught his hand in hers and pressed her face to his palm, kissing it. I'm fine. I'm a healer, remember? It's not the first time you've collapsed into my arms. She cleared her throat and forced herself to speak firmly. Now, I need you to answer my questions. Draco, what did he do? Tell me, what did he do to you? Draco was silent for a moment and then sighed. He says I'm at fault for the spreading insurgency. If I were more competent, I'd be containing it. He decided I was due to offer proof of loyalty. A few hours of legitimacy then, it occurred to him that I'm an Occlamans, he snorted. He had someone crucio me while he checked again. He swallowed. Fortunately, he was tired by then, so it didn't last so long the second time. A twisted smile ghosted across his lips. As a reward for proving my continued loyalty, I've been given the rest of the week off. So, at least there's that. His attempt to sound reassuring and sarcastic made it worse. Hermione's hands began shaking as she fought off a sense of hysteria. Just breathe, she said to herself. Just breathe. You can't panic right now. He'll hurt himself more if he thinks you're going to have a seizure. Draco squinted and turned his head, as though he were trying to glance around the room. It's not night, is it? I don't think I can see. He pressed the back of his hand against his eyes. That's new. Hermione started going through Draco's robes, burning her fingertips as she kept pulling out weapons concealed in the dozens of pockets lining his robes. Finally, her hands closed around a familiar leather case and she pulled it out. She flipped open the healing kit and jerked out the vial of calming draught. She bit out the cork with her teeth, tilting Draco's head up onto her lap as she held the vial to his lips. Draught of peace. It will slow your heart rate and ease the way your muscles are spasming. She waited, running her fingers through his hair and talking to him so that he'd stay calm and lucid. She felt the potion take effect as his body relaxed into her lap. She picked up his right arm and pulled out his wand slipping its handle into his left hand, holding it in place so that his spasming fingers wouldn't drop it. Draco, 
She kept her voice carefully steady. I need you to cast a diagnostic for me. Can you try? I'll help with the wand motion, but it has to be your magic. It was a diagnostic targeted at his brain and nervous system, and it took six tries before the spell would hold. She studied it quietly for several minutes. The legilimency strains your optic nerves. That's why your eyes aren't working. It's not permanent. You just need to rest so it can heal. Your, your nerve damage from the torture is... Her jaw trembled and she swallowed. He really shouldn't keep torturing you. Draco snorted and started to reply, but his entire body spasmed. He didn't make a sound, but pressed his lips together so tightly they turned white. There was a pop and Bobbin reappeared, surrounded by potions and medical supplies. Hermione looked at the elf. Can you levitate him onto the bed for me? He's too heavy for me to lift. And take his clothes off. These robes are filthy. Bobbin can. The elf snapped her fingers and Draco floated carefully over towards the bed. Hermione went over and started sorting through all the supplies. They were all labelled many of them in a sharp, spiky script she knew had been Severus's. She selected four potions and went back to Draco. Bobbin had removed his clothes, cleaned Draco's face and tucked him into the bed. Hermione leaned over him, studying his eyes and taking note of all the physical symptoms she could detect. He was ghastly pale and his chest kept hitching as he tried to breathe in a way that wasn't painful. She rested a hand against his forehead You should have taken a pain relief potion with you, she said after a moment. You were the one who told me not to apparate after legilimency without taking a pain relief potion first. You always had one for me. The corner of his mouth twitched. She looked down and unstoppered one of the vials she'd brought over, pressing it to his hand. He downed it with a grimace. She handed him the next potion. I should have included one in your healing kit. I ran out of space. I should have put a pain potion in instead of a Myrtlap essence. Draco blinked and she could tell he was trying to force his eyes to focus on her as she handed him the third potion. She picked up his empty hand and pressed it against her cheek. You already know what I look like. Rest your eyes. Your head will hurt less if you keep your eyes closed. He obstinately narrowed them, trying to make out her face for a moment longer before obeying. She watched some of the lines of tension around his eyes and mouth fade slowly and his breathing gradually evened. When she was sure the potions had taken effect, she moved on. Who's your healer? Who treats you after he tortures you? You need to call them. You're not going to be able to move for weeks without treatment. Draco's face remained neutral, but his fingers twitched. Hermione felt her chest tighten after he failed to answer for several seconds. Draco, I deal with it myself unless it's life-threatening, he said finally. The words were so low they were almost under his breath. He didn't open his eyes. Severus used to help occasionally when it was something I didn't know how to heal, but otherwise it's my job. Hermione stared at him in horror. Draco cracked an eye open and squinted at her before snorting. He raised one eyebrow and closed his eyes again, his expression tightening. You may recall you once put a rather rare stone into my heart. It may not show in diagnostics, but I have to avoid healers as much as I can. If the Dark Lord began receiving repeated reports that I'm physically pristine, despite having had dark runes carved onto my back for three years, he'd have more than a few questions. I'd probably end up with my heart cut out. When it's something life-threatening, I call a healer and obliviate them afterwards. But half the healers in England would be addled at this point if I called an obliviated one every time I was crucioed. Hermione felt as though he had gutted her. I didn't... I didn't realise. It's fine, Granger. He didn't open his eyes, but waved her off with his free hand. The corner of his mouth quirked up. I've been told several times now that I have a natural talent for healing. Her jaw kept trembling and she ground her teeth together for a moment before she slipped his wand into his fingers. Can, can you do the spell for me then? 
He muttered the spell while she guided his fingers, tapping across the pressure points of his right hand and his forearm. His fingers spasmed repeatedly as she helped him send the mild vibrations into the drawn muscles, easing the tension. His fingers finally fell open after several minutes, and she lay his wand aside, picking up his right hand and began to try to fix all the damage. Her fingers began cramping and she ignored it. She kept working until his hands stopped twitching and would lie still. She picked up the last potion she'd brought over and poured a small amount of the embrocation onto her palm. Starting at the ball of his thumb, she began rubbing it gently, working it down to his wrist and forearm and then all the way up to his shoulders. The potion was warm and made her skin tingle as she massaged it into his skin, trying to repair all the rigid knots and torn muscles. When she looked up after finishing both arms, Draco was asleep, his eyebrows tightly furrowed. She studied him for several seconds before reaching out and brushing her fingertips lightly between his eyes, trying to banish the tension. Without Draco to cast the spells, trying to massage away the knots and tremors took longer. She continued anyway. Without him awake, she could cry safely while she worked. He slept for nearly 48 hours. Hermione stayed with him almost the entire time. His expression relaxed when she was in bed beside him, talking to him quietly about anything that came to mind, running her fingers through his hair and working on his muscle damage. She nearly depleted his entire supply of embrocation potions. When she became too restless to sit beside him, she would quietly pace. She looked out of the window the next morning and spotted Lucius walking the length of the north wing as though he were trying to measure it in paces. He looked up and their eyes met. Hermione's blood ran cold. She met his gaze for only a moment before shrinking back from sight. Every time Draco woke, Hermione checked his eyes and had him perform basic healing spells for her. He kept dozing until Bobbin came in to report that Lucius was at Draco's door and threatening to break it down if he didn't see Draco. Draco forced himself up. How long have I been here? I was only given three days off. Bobbin, bring me a full set of robes. Hermione tried to hold him back. Draco, wait. Your eyes still haven't recovered. You still have half a day. You need to rest for as long as possible. He rolled his eyes and stood up stiffly as Bobbin popped back with a pile of robes. That's what I keep pain relief for. He dressed and made his way over to the potions Bobbin had brought. He squinted as he held them a few inches from his face, trying to read the labels. He knocked back five of them in quick succession, ignoring Hermione's objections that certain types of pain relief shouldn't be combined. He rolled his eyes. I'm well versed in pain relief. I can almost guarantee this won't be the thing that kills me. He blinked repeatedly and shook his head. Hermione could tell he still couldn't see reliably. Be careful, Draco. He smiled briefly as he met her eyes. I'll be fine. She still caught the tensed, braced expression on his face the split second before he apparated. Bobbin came back a few hours later and took away all the medical supplies. Master Draco was fine, she said, while avoiding Hermione's eyes. He just wanted an inventory for which potions Hermione had used. Hermione was left alone to occupy herself in her cage, worrying and wondering what was happening beyond the bedroom door.